I had been working as a security guard at the old abandoned warehouse for over a year, and I thought that I had seen it all. I had dealt with the occasional trespasser, the odd critter that had wandered in through a broken window, and the occasional false alarm. But one night something happened that would change everything. It was a particularly quiet night with nothing out of the ordinary happening. I was patrolling the perimeter of the warehouse, making sure that all the doors and windows were secure, when I heard a strange noise coming from inside of the building. It sounded almost like a growling, but I waved it off and thought that it couldn't be that. Anyway, I hesitated for a moment, unsure of what to do. But then I remembered that I was being paid to protect the building and the assets that were inside, so I had to go and investigate. I cautiously made my way towards the sound, my flashlight sweeping back and forth to light my way. As I approached the area where the noise was coming from, I began to smell something off. It was almost fouling away and it made me want to gag. I knew then that something wasn't right. I turned the corner and saw it. It was almost like a creature, but it was standing on two legs like a human. It was pretty dark out and my flashlight wasn't the best, so it was kind of hard to tell. It was unlike anything that I had ever seen before and I knew immediately that it had to be dangerous. I fumbled for my radio, trying to call for backup, but my hands were shaking so badly that I had dropped it, and the thing turned its head and faced me. Its eyes locked onto mine and I felt a surge of fear wash over me. The creature let out another yell, probably what I had heard before, and then it headed my way. I stumbled backwards trying to get away, but I tripped over a piece of debris on the ground and I fell to the floor. The thing was on me in a minute and I tried to fight it off, but it was surprisingly strong. I felt its fingernails rake against my skin and before I knew it, I was knocked unconscious. When I finally came to, I was lying on the ground. The creature or the thing was gone and the warehouse was eerily silent. I stumbled to my feet and stumbled back to my security booth, my mind reeling from what had happened. I called the police and told them what I had seen. When they arrived on site, they did a quick check of the warehouse and all of its assets and found that nothing had been taken or any evidence of a break-in had happened. They didn't truly really believe that it was some supernatural creature, and in hindsight, I didn't mention that my eyesight is pretty bad, so it could have just been a very creepy looking man strung out on something and they had freaked out when they saw me and attacked me. Because of what had happened, I wasn't able to keep my position and I later was fired. I guess not being a tough security guard and getting beaten up by a random guy isn't the best look for somebody to look after some wealthy assets. Anyway, I wasn't too broken up about it. I knew that after what happened, I never really could go back to being a security guard. Even though I had thought I had seen it all, I was definitely surprised. I don't know what compelled me to finally share this, but I've been thinking about it a lot the past few days and thought that it would fit this sub relatively well. I'm one of those longtime lurkers who has been sitting on their own story for ages, but I finally got around to writing down my own experience and I hope someone out there finds this interesting to read. My apologies in advance for the length. I have a lot of thoughts about this, as it was the first and only time I felt legitimately afraid for my life. When I was about 8 years old, my parents were going through a divorce and me and my older sister used to spend a lot of time at our grandparents' house. It's a long, ranch-style home, on a corner in a very nice neighborhood that's a 10-minute walk from a gas station, grocery store, and a few fast food restaurants. These streets are long and lined with well-manicured houses cradled by big, scenic California Valley hills all around. We were never wealthy, but my grandpa had bought it up as a fixer-upper many years ago, and the property value had skyrocketed since then. As you can imagine, it's a very safe spot, and although there weren't many other kids in the neighborhood, 
and it wasn't uncommon to see neighbors walking their dogs or pushing a stroller down the sidewalk outside of her house. Although my mom was especially protective all of our lives, this particular neighborhood was densely populated and my family knew just about everybody who lived there. She grew up in that neighborhood herself, so she was understandably trusting. She would once in a while let me and my sister walk to the Rotten Robbie gas station on the other end of the block to grab a snack. I would always get a ring pop and my sister would grab a three musketeers before we made our way back home. My sister was about 11 at the time and this small amount of freedom was a really big deal to us. Nothing compared to walking down that street all by ourselves in the summertime laughing and joking around, a couple of dollar bills in our pockets. I felt like I owned the world. The one oddity that I noticed around the neighborhood was a small camper parked on the side of the road, opposite to the gas station, right along the back side of the fence of another house. It sat there in the shade like a permanent fixture, all the windows constantly covered by an opaque beige curtain. I can't explain why, but it always gave me this deep sense of foreboding when I'd pass it. I was almost positive that someone was living inside of it because, at times, I would hear the air conditioning running as it sat stagnant in that same spot. The hairs on my neck would always stand on end as I passed it, usually as I passed the camper door, and I would always keep an eye on it for the fear that, one day, it would swing open just as I came to pass by. I think what bothered me the most was a drawing taped to the door from the inside. It was extremely messy, a sketch of odd lines and a brown colored pencil that was frustratingly indiscernible. I could see the outline of something, a vague shape, but could never make out what it was intended to be. I never had the nerves to stop and stare long enough to really investigate, but each time I walked by, I'd steal a glance. A year prior to the incident I'm about to describe, I was walking with my mom past the camper in the shade. We had just gone to the park nearby and, unfortunately, had to pass the camper before we could cross the street to continue walking. I didn't want to seem afraid, so I kept on walking right behind her and didn't object when she walked past it. This time, I felt a little more brave. I was frustrated at not being able to decipher the drawing for so long, and while my mom was feet away, I stopped in front of the camper door and took a moment to really look at the drawing. Upon closer inspection, the paper was filthy. I remember doing a project in elementary school where we had soaked printer paper in black coffee to make it look aged, and that's what it reminded me of. My mom walked on without noticing that I had stopped following her, but my eyes stayed fixed on the indistinct mass of dirt caked scribbles until I could make out what looked like to be a tiny, malformed face. My stomach turned. I immediately felt cold and disgusted as my eyes trailed over the rest of the image. I didn't know what kind of creature it was at the time, but now I can look back and say the drawing was a badly deformed fetus inside a mass of large, perfect circles, like those made by a circular ring ruler. Its face was contorted as if in pain. It was so graphically disturbing and seemed to portray this odd sense of suffering that it stuck with me for days. As a child, I didn't know how to process it, and the mental image still makes me sick to think about. I had never seen anything like it before. Adrenaline flooded my body and my chest, hurt with fear. But I selfishly thought of my glorious little trips for ring pops and said absolutely nothing as I followed behind my mother. This was, in retrospect, a classically terrible idea. It's one of those things you scream at main characters in movies for. Ever since my ill feelings towards the camper had been elevated by the drawing on the door, 
I thought about it every time that we drove by. And about a month later, my mom once again graced us with several bucks and permission to walk down to Rotten Robbie and grab our respective snacks. I thought about telling my sister about what I had seen on the way there, but she was older and braver and I was terrified that she would make me cross the street with her to check it out. It was a bright, sunny day, and I told myself with false certainty that nothing was going to happen. If I didn't acknowledge it, maybe it would go away. We walked past the camper and it was thankfully uneventful. On the walk back, I was feeling more comfortable and I was focused on fighting open my candy wrapper while my sister walked alongside me. We passed the camper a second time, but I didn't give it half as much thought as the first time. I don't remember what we were talking about, but I recall being interrupted mid-sentence as my sister softly yet firmly said my name. There was a distinct fear in her voice that immediately set me on edge, like a bucket of ice water. All my senses heightened and I became aware of everything, including the sound of haphazard footsteps about 10 feet behind us. It was accompanied by a heavy rustling sound, like a heavy backpack, and nervously, I turned my head to look. A man with a long, unkempt beard and wearing many layers of ragged clothing stood behind us, eyes unmistakably burning into our backs as he walked. His movements were normal. It was a drunken shuffle. Like each of his feet were unimaginably heavy and needed to be moved one grand effort at a time. His shoulders were skewed, head tilted downward with a strange arc of his neck. I could hear his shoes scraping the gravel with every step, but rather than seeming genuinely intoxicated, it was as if he was intentionally meandering our direction, like a zombie with the direct effort to frighten us. Behind him, I saw the camper door was wide open for the first time in all the years that we had spent living there, and realized that this was the man who had been living inside. He's following us, I choked out, my eyes filling with tears. My mind was spinning and I stared straight ahead again. The wide streets and sidewalks abnormally empty all around. My sister grabbed my hand. She squeezed it hard enough to hurt without licking my way, speaking carefully under her breath. On the count of three, we race home, she told me in a very serious tone of voice. I couldn't reply through the growing lump in my throat, but every single cell in my body understood that we had to put some distance between us and this man as quickly as possible. She began to count steadily while we walked faster, and the most terrifying part is that he started running before we even had a chance to. He must have heard her directions to me and tried to get a head start by sprinting our direction before she got to three. But his footsteps were noisy, and we bolted like deer the instant that we heard him behind us. I'll never forget it. The chase felt exactly like you imagine in your nightmares. The fear your pursuer is inches away from grabbing your arm, or a fistful of your hair. I pictured myself being dragged into the van with nobody around to see or hear me. We ran so fast that we didn't even have the breath to scream and peering back behind me about 10 seconds later, I saw him running in our direction, with absolutely none of the impairment he had showed, with those zombie-like steps moments before. I think back on it now, and he may have been deliberately pretending to be handicapped to lower our guard so we wouldn't start running. The thought is terrifying, but I can't rationalize it any other way. We made it to our grandparents' house and, without looking behind us, we yanked open the stubborn old door before slamming it closed and scrambling past their excited dogs to get to as deep in the house as we could. I don't even think that we locked it, as our main goal was getting within the line of sight of any adult as quickly as possible. My mom was talking to my grandpa at the table, 
and gave us an amused look when we bounded into the living room. Since we were kids, running around wasn't anything out of the ordinary, and she didn't ask what happened as we collapsed on the couch and tried to catch our breath. The inside of the house felt so safe and felt in such good spirits that I didn't even want to bring up what had just happened. Like waking up from a nightmare you didn't want to talk about. I was desperate to go back to normalcy. I wanted to forget it entirely. To unwrap my candy and act like everything was completely normal. For the sake of my own sanity. And that's exactly what I did. I asked my sister a few years back if she remembered the incident. I'm 25 and she's 28 now. And her response was strange. She remembered immediately without the need for me to provide details. But she quickly waved it off. Man insisted that he had to have been a bored homeless man looking to scare some kids walking home. With no real intent to harm anyone. I don't know. I would like to believe it's some innocent misunderstanding. But like they always say about gut feelings, they're rarely wrong. I feel in my soul that he wanted to hurt me and my sister that day. I never told her or anyone else about the strange drawing on the door. And I'm not sure if my sister saw the open door and connected him to the camper or not. It's one of my biggest regrets as I would hate for any other children to have been less fortunate after innocently walking past the camper and the shade. I believe he may have chosen the spot between the park and gas station deliberately due to the number of kids walking around the area. I never saw the camper again after that day or so on. I'm not proud of how I handled this, and I would encourage anyone who finds themselves in a similar situation to contact authorities immediately for the safety of others around and yourself. I don't know if maybe this whole story comes off as melodramatic, but it was very real and very frightening in a way that I can't forget. So, a possibly deranged camper guy by the gas station Whatever your intent was, let's not meet. I used to daydream about driving across the country in an RV and seeing the world. I had a wanderlust like no other, and the van dwellers of Instagram really made it look so easy and fun. I was hooked and after I made up my mind, I bought a van and souped it up with a bed, drawer, storage, a bike rack and even a little bathroom area. The tiny home on wheels held so much potential and the future looked bright. Or so I thought. I made my way to the first destination on my list, Charleston, USA. It was beautiful and I had dreams of spending my days on the beach and watching the sun rise and set each morning. Well, as some of you may or may not know, this was a van and some stealth camping needed to be done to ensure safety and that I wouldn't get towed or bothered by law enforcement. Volume levels were low and lights were always dimmed when I spent time in my van. Not only that, but the windows were tinted and I had curtains as well so you really couldn't see anything through them. One of the first nights I decided to park in a back alley parking lot with no street lights and no pedestrian traffic. I felt safe and comfortable enough to relax and play some Pokemon on my DS. I was propped up on a pillow that was laying against the back of double doors. About 30 minutes after I had parked, I noticed a man walk past my van. He seemed to be in a hurry, so I didn't pay him any mind. About 15 minutes pass and I hear a jingle sound and then scraping noises. I turn around and there he is. The same man trying to break into my van as I'm sitting in it. Our faces are only inches apart through the glass. He doesn't see me. In this moment, I kind of reacted as you would if a dog does something and you want to get its attention and make it stop. I have dogs, so this was automatic. And I made a sound that was sort of like, Hey! Well, that'll get his attention. And he looks up and squints at me. I say, get the heck out, he goes, oh crap, and he runs off. 
Looking back, it was kind of funny as I knew he didn't mean me any harm and probably grabbed his pants when he found out that I had caught him. It was really the next night that made me realize that van living isn't all it's cracked up to be. I decided to park in a more crowded area the next night. Before hungry and down, I drove to a nearby grocery store to grab food. Little naive me thought, since this is a grocery store, I should be able to have my lights on bright and not be bothered. I turned the lights up and do some cleaning before bed, folding clothes, fluffing pillows, sweeping, etc. I notice a car across the parking lot that's cranked up with its lights on, but hasn't actually pulled out yet. I don't pay it any mind and I finish up my cleaning. The next thing I know, the same car has driven up behind my van and is just sitting in the lane, not moving. I wait for a while and it doesn't budge so I decide to cut off my lights and sit in the driver's seat to observe. It still doesn't move. My internal alarm system is going berserk so I decide to get the heck out of there and crank up my van so I can leave. I need to pull out but the car is blocking me. I start inching out in reverse and the driver finally gets the message and drives away. I watch the car leave and stop at an intersection. There are only two ways it could go, I thought. It could either go left, which exits the parking lot and means that the person isn't a threat. Or it could go right, which circles back into the parking lot and means that this person possibly is a threat. I wait and watch and for some reason, I don't see which direction the car turns. I chalk it up to getting confused and being paranoid. And after a few minutes, I decide to leave. Remember when I said that there were only two ways the car could go? Well, I was wrong. There was another way that it could go, and that direction is straightened into another parking lot. When I arrived at the intersection, wouldn't you know, it's the car from before and it's part, still cranked, with the lights on, facing the intersection. I'm sweating bullets and I book it over to where I plan on sleeping, hoping that if I'm driving fast enough, I'll lose this creep. My spot for the night was going to be a 24-hour gym. And lots of streetlights, people walking across the lot at all hours of the night. Seemed like the perfect place to sleep since the previous night I almost had a break-in while parked in a dark, empty area. I park and wait. I don't see anyone other than gym rats with duffel bags and water bottles in hand. I let my guard down and start getting ready for bed. Just as I am reaching into the front seat to grab my phone, I see this car and finally the driver of the car, a white male, peering into the windshield of my van. And he does see me as my front window is the only window that isn't tinted. We lock eyes and I freak the heck out. He starts circling my van with his vehicle. So I pull out and find a parking spot right next to the front door of the gym where he can't circle me anymore. Well, bucko, he doesn't give up. He just parks across from me, car still cranked, lights still on, facing me. I understand that I'm in danger and decide to call someone I know that lives in Charleston. Thankfully, they let me stay with them for the night. So, once I got the okay to head over there, I drove out of the parking lot and drove as fast as I could to my friend's house. It was 30 minutes away and I was driving so fast that I don't even know if and for how long the guy was following me. Needless to say, hashtag van life is a lot more dangerous than the IG van dwellers would have you think. I felt duped and eventually just got an apartment. I feel a lot safer and even though I would still like to travel, I intend to stay at an RV park the next go around. As far as the stalker that I encountered, how about let's not meet again, shall we?